How do you feel about tripping to places you've never even heard of? Does it stoke your sense of adventure and curiosity? Or does it make you nervous to veer from the beaten path, fearing you'll waste a whole trip to see a whole lot of nothing? Well, fear not, because our destination has all the things you didn't even know you were looking for. Ah, regular rock. Regular rock. Chet, what are you doing? I'm looking for a paint rock. Yeah. Wait. Oh, paint rock. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. I'm willing to bet you've never been here, maybe never even heard of it, but the town of Paint Rock sits right on the line between Central and West Texas. Closest city is San Angelo, 30 miles away. It's a sleepy little town on the Concho River with less than 300 people, probably way more goats. But despite its size, it's still a full-blown county seat, courthouse and all, which gives you an idea of just how few people live in this county. So this is Paint Rock, Texas. I, I know, I know, it's not a whole lot to look at. In fact, the population is about a third of what it was 100 years ago, making it one of the smallest county seats in all of Texas. But remember, you can't judge a small country town by what's in town. To do that, you have to head to the country. So let's go and check out this town's namesake. This town exists because of its proximity to one very important historic site with, you guessed it, painted rocks, but unlike any other on our continent. So the painted rocks themselves are on a private ranch. They do open it up for public tours, but you have to set up an appointment and they give you a little code for the gate. Here we go. Welcome to the Campbell Ranch, a beautiful, rugged piece of Texas, settled in the 1870s by an adventurous man who came to Texas to learn about the Southern Plains Indians. And this is his granddaughter, Kay Campbell. They bought all they needed just to camp out and travel along following Indian trail, see what they could find. They had found things that Indians had left at the water hole. Okay, yeah. And so when he got to Paint Rock, and here it was, the payload. He found the pictograph. Payload indeed. 1,500 different drawings on a bluff above the Concho River. To protect the art, he scrounged up some money and bought the land. And at 94, Kay is still carrying on his passion and legacy. I was exposed to this when I was such a young child that it has become a real serious part of me. When I'd go to visit a friend, I'd say, well, would you show me your pictograph? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you and got pictographs, say, we all have say, pictographs. No, there's no pictographs here. I was like, well, what's the matter with you? <laughs> well, I'm gonna say the same thing to Kay. Show me your pictographs. And to show us around the property, here's Kay's son, Bill. Okay, so how old do we think these paintings are? Well, they range probably from 2,000 years to 150 years. Okay. For the Comanche Indians and the Humano before that, this seems to have been a very special place where they left some very interesting drawings. This is what we have always called the plume serpent. The a, plume serpent. A god, and it would be up in the clouds, head of a snake, and lightning would come out of, out of its mouth. Sounds like a Ozzy Osbourne Black Sabbath song or something. Yeah, my Head man. of a snake and the body <laughs> of a dragon. There are lots of unusual shapes, but some are less abstract and can be tied to actual events. This is showing the massacre, the mission San Saba, that uh, the two people are uh, priests. When the massacre occurred, his, his head was cut off. It's a Comanche painting. Oh, that makes a lot of sense to me. Evidence suggests that this was an Indian festival ground for thousands of years, and not just for small nomadic travelers, but big group blowouts on certain days, especially the winter solstice. I can tell you how they started the ceremonies. 
Okay. The solar markers. This is the big one. And mom says it's a turtle with the sun on its back. <laughs> Kim Cox says it's the fire of the sun. Uh, on solar noon on the winter solstice, there's this undagger. You might call it the solar fire drill. On the solstice and equinox, shadows cast by the rocks above begin to interact with the drawings in amazing ways. They only discovered solar markers here in 1996. Really? And there's lots of them here. A game-changing discovery, really. Kay's favorite is this little figure who on the winter equinox walks up this shadow line. It seems this was their calendar, telling them all when it was time to get together. It was a big party. The solar markers would tell them what time it was to do what dance. Yeah, this is the uh, original Woodstock grounds. Oh, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> but stare too long and your mind can really wonder. You see that? Looks kind of like a jellyfish. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it also looks like a UFO. Uh-oh, now <laughs> we've opened a bag here. <laughs> It's fascinating listening to the stories and theories about what all these pictographs mean. They all have kind of the same reason to be there. You know, it's, just, yeah. it's their attempt to communicate their feelings and their thoughts. Do you feel like you get the message? We all get a different message. And that's when it's fun when each person tries to convince the other person that and there it is, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I love a good Texas-sized mystery. And there are many mysteries in pictographs. Will we solve this mystery in the future? Well, only if we can go back to the past. But the fun in the present is the pondering. I'm impressed. I, I love learning about it, but I don't know if I could dedicate my life to, to studying something that I know will never, ever be solved. Yeah? It's like, what does it mean? Guess what, buddy? You're going to have that exact same question on your deathbed because ain't nobody going to tell you. It's like theology, though. Religion? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I guess you'll know in the next, in the afterlife. And yeah, yeah, you, you, you do reach a solution there. You think in the afterlife, someone goes, about that painting <laughs> you were thinking of. <laughs> Here's the answer. Remember that one time. Cha-ching. You know, the turkey inside the circles with the other uh, thing eating it? Here's what that means. I'm gonna blow your mind. It wasn't a turkey <laughs> at all. <laughs> what? It was what? a chicken. Oh my goodness. The fun is always in the learning. In fact, I'm so excited. I think we should go back to school. Well, for lunch anyway. At the Eola School, where they've made a few upgrades to the curriculum, like live music, craft food, and craft beer. As this old campus is now the home of Farm L Brewing Company, and trust me, Nobody is skipping class at this campus. Here are the owners, Jason and Karen. This is absolutely incredible what y'all are pulling off out of this old building. I mean, you can still feel the old school. I mean, there's chalkboards in this room. Yes. Are they yeah. original chalkboards? Are they really? Yeah, yeah. Every, yeah, everything's original. So each one of these rooms you're passing by used to be school rooms. This is the third and fourth grade school room. From 1929 until the 80s, this campus held grades K through 12 for this small farming community. The vision now is to help take visitors back to a simpler time. This is amazing right here. This is it one is. of my favorite rooms. We have live bands in here, music, dancing, true game room for the kids. We're the only brewery in the United States that actually has a gymnasium like this. You can come in and hang out. And that is a roller racer, right? I hadn't yes. ridden a roller racer in so long. Come on, give me a boost! Oh, bowling! Strike! When it comes to craft beer, these guys are teaching everybody lessons on how to do it right. Making four year-round beers and giving a percentage of their profits back to the farmers. All of it brewed and canned right here in the old auditorium. This is awesome. I've been in a lot of breweries in Texas, never one anywhere close to this. In an old <laughs> historic auditorium? Hey, what do you this one didn't get a cap. There you go. So Lola messes up every once in a while. We don't get the lid on it. <laughs> uh, so that's a perk of being here with, during our canning session. So congratulations. <laughs> what a shame. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's good beer. Yes. That's great beer. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Cheers to that. Chris, the brewmaster, leads a solid team of locals making beer for the locals. I don't think my crew realizes just how complicated his job is. 
All right, now I know all y'all came here just to drink some beer, but we are in a schoolhouse. I figured we better learn something before we leave. So I would like to teach y'all how beer is made. All right, everybody pay attention. So all beer comes from grain, grain, barley, hops, you add yeast, you add water. We go first off into the water ton where hot water is added to extract sugars from the, no one's eat, are y'all asleep? Oh, y'all are incorrigible. Hey, I have a question. Yes, Daniel. What do you think about my pony? You drew that pony? Yeah. What do you think this is? You think this is art class? This is science. This is thermodynamics. Oh, let's just go drink it. Fine. All right, let's go. Finally. Well, it's a good thing that next on my class schedule is lunch. And trust me, this isn't the food you got served in your childhood cafeteria. Insanely delicious smash burgers, artisan thin crust pizza, and rotating specials like meatloaf and mashed potatoes. This looks like some really good farmer food to me. All right, now it is time for my favorite class in school, culinary arts, right here. Oh yeah. So I got some of their meatloaf. Uh, it has house cured bacon in it. Jack cheese seeping out on the side. Can you see that? Anytime your food is dripping cheese before you eat it, it's gonna be some good food right there. Oh my gosh. I was not expecting the deliciousness of that meatloaf. I don't know where that chef studied, but he needs a PhD. I'm naming him Dr. Chef right now, Dr. Meatloaf Chef. Mm. I know I get excited about stuff when I'm eating it, but this might be the best meatloaf I've ever had, ever. We're working the full food pyramid. We got vegetables, we got starches, we got meat. It's your grains. Oh, it is grains, <laughs> right there. You can justify everything if you use the right words. It's really hard to find a reason not to love this place. I mean, it's a place to bring your family, to meet your friends, to share a great meal, and to fellowship around some really great beer. Be cool, stay in school. And very importantly, respect your teachers. Have we learned our lesson yet, Todd? Yes, thank you, sir. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. Well, we dipped away from the town of Paint Rock for lunch, but it's time to head back into town to visit a family doing way more than just painting rocks. This is Three Nail Ironware, a blacksmith shop producing stunning carbon steel skillets by hand with owner Randy Kaiser at the forge. Y'all do really beautiful work out here. Well, thank you. Well, tell, me, you. tell me a little bit about we it. We take a lot of pride in them. I did architectural work for almost 30 years, and I was looking for something else to do. Uh -huh. And I saw a couple of guys making skillets, and so I made one. And I took it to the house and used it. Now I was sold. Compared to cast iron, they're almost like a Ferrari compared to a, a Volkswagen. Each skillet or pan is unique, bearing the hammer marks of its maker. And it didn't take long before the demand was so high, Randy didn't have to do architectural work anymore. But he still brings those principles here. Everything has a line to it. Things that you touch have to convey quality. Yeah. So that's why whenever you grab the handle, it feels right. It does, you got that groove for the thumb. Well, and the back's curved a little bit. Yeah. It, this, to me, is the ultimate form and function. And the best part is, is the amount of people that we're able to meet and come in. We're, we're, it's so exciting. Walk in almost any day and Randy will show you around. Just don't expect to buy a skillet. The wait list is months long. After all, you can't rush hard. This is how it starts, we make the pans out of flat disc. Is it funny to look at that and think somebody's gonna make scrambled eggs on that someday in their kitchen? You know, That's funny to me. I was trying to tell my wife that we need to sell a kit with just the blanks and then when you send them out like that, it'd be a lot cheaper. <laughs> having the tools to make a skillet, very different from having the skills to use them. And around here, skills run in the family. This is my son, James. James? Good to see you. The, the beard genes are strong in y'all's family. Very strong. That's it. Yeah, I'll go with the receding hairline. <laughs> yeah. Randy and James make an incredible team, along with both of their wives who keep this place running. So, a heated disc gets pressed and the skillet starts to take shape. Uh, that, this is really uh, what it looks like right as it comes out of the die. And now making the handle, where most of the true artistry takes place. Yeah. So, when it comes out of that 
fire, you just have a couple seconds to work on it. It'll never move as easy as it does right when it comes out of the fire. We start striking back into it. Okay. And see how it bends. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bunching it up. You probably get sort of zen yes. in here, don't you? Just Absolutely. in the zone. Do you jam music? Do oh you, yeah. What's your playlist for blacksmithing? I love Texas music. I listen to Hayes Carl, oh. 90s alternative rock. Okay. Yeah. 90s alternative. I'm, I'm picturing some some REM. Fire! If you wanted to do this next one. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you okay. Time to mess up a pan. <laughs> okay. It's a little bit it, bigger than yours. Well, it, the shape isn't right because I didn't get the shape right to begin with. But that's okay. We can. So we, that's your fault. That it's that's wrong? my fault. That's my fault. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> so right there. Right there. There you go. There you go. So from start to finish, let's say on a 10-inch skillet, how many man hours? It's got to be at least two. Two man hours? It's got to be longer two than that. Yeah, well. I'm You've the, never done the math, have I'm you? The, no, I haven't. <laughs> like I said, remember, remember I was talking about that void of time? Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah. That's, it's a good thing Randy has his family here to run things when he gets in the zone. Well, you think like, you know, you being a family man, so much, so much revolves around someone's kitchen. And to think that you are in the middle of all these big family gatherings, that's gotta be kinda, kinda cool. Oh, it's very neat. Everybody enjoys eating and fellowshipping around a meal and all that. And to be, to have something that's in the centerpiece, but also kinda enhance that environment in uh -huh. a way, oh man, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely awesome. That's it, awesome. It is. I've long held that food is art. How much more so when it's prepared in a skillet that's been crafted by an artist's hands and forged in the fires of Texas. I don't know about y'all, but I have zero bars on the phone. Oh, let me see. <laughs> I've got one. Where we go, we don't need phones, John Mark. I mean, the people out here don't know about cell phones yet. They just, they haven't, it wow. hasn't reached them. Oh man, wow. I'm just kidding. I'm okay. Kidding. I'm kidding. We're so connected in the cities, and there's parts of Texas where it's like, man, I don't get a cell, I don't, I don't get a signal, man, not a big deal. Man, <laughs> man. They say that a lot. Man. Welcome to Meh, Texas. <laughs> Did you enjoy your day trip? Meh. <laughs> well, this day trip is way more than meh. Now, y'all know that I love getting outdoors, but with so much farmland in this part of Texas, there are few places to get outside, but there is a nearby lake worth a visit. So we do not have a boat and we did not bring a fishing pole, but there is still a lake out in this part of Texas that I'm eager to go and check out. It's where two mighty titans of Texas meet. A place where the Concho River joins the mighty Colorado as both pour into OH Ivy Lake. You know, even if you're not gonna go out on a boat, sometimes just being by the water, you know, it's good for the soul. Let the water wash over us. So, over here you have the Concho River flowing in. Over yonder, the Colorado flows in. And from this point, all the way to the coast, it's the Colorado River. So if you start heading that way, you go right through the heart of Austin, all the way down till you get to Matagorda, Texas, and you dump in the Gulf of Mexico. I've always been fascinated by rivers. They curve and wind along ancient paths that can move at any time with little to no regard for us humans. They are alive and support life both below and above the water. Well, it's been a good long day, and the crew is as hungry as I am and excited to eat dinner at one of Texas's most famous steak restaurants. Well, most of us are excited anyway. Todd, I'm scared to even ask, but yeah, what are you gonna get when we go to this steak place? I know, I already know. A what? side of mushrooms. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm like, I'm like it's a toss up between mushrooms and a port wine sauce, or a salad. <laughs> is this embarrassing? Like, or, I mean, wow. this is just. Will you at least try it? Todd, like Todd, steak. he doesn't like steak. Like are you Todd aside, the crew and I are always down for a great Texas steak. 
And since 1951, fellow steak lovers have been traveling for hours just to have dinner at the Lewakey Steakhouse. It's classic Texas fare in the most Texan of settings. Today, the steakhouse sits in Rowena, about six miles from its original location in Lewakey, but still a good distance from any major town. And when it started, well, there was a very good reason folks were willing to travel so far to eat here. Back in 1951, there was only a few places you could sit down, have a meal, and drink a beer at the same time. And this was one of the counties that started that. So okay. Before, they were just restaurants or they were bars. Sure. The Loiki Inn started in 49. Okay. This one had opened in 51. There were several other little restaurants open down the road. That's I understand all. there was an airstrip down there. People would literally yep. fly to this cotton patch that because is. they could have a meal and a beer. That is correct. This is current owner, Kerry Getz. His mother and grandmother both worked here, going back to the 60s. This different generation, this uh, yes. place has been around long enough to yep, see so many things change. Yes. How much has the steak changed? Not really that much. Okay, I mean, yeah. Prices. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, no doubt. Rewind the clock and you could get the extra large T-bone for three bucks. And they do mean extra large around here. Another 35 ounces, at least an inch and a half cut. That's a monster steak, it's, man. I guess you can come down to our average size steaks. We, <laughs> we got our eight average yeah. size. We've got our 18 ounce. Hey, this on, is what he says. The, the 18 ounce steak is not the large steak, no, if that tells you anything yeah. about this place. Harry and the team cut every steak they serve in-house. But it isn't just the cut that makes the difference, it's also how you cook it. And Lewakey does it the Lewakey way. All right, Chet, this is where the magic happens. So, now what do you want to have? Oh, don't make me decide. What's the, how specialty? That would be our Kansas City, most popular. That's what everybody orders, all served family style. Is that what you want? Let's do it. All right. Family of one right here. How about that? That gonna work for you? <laughs> I think that'll work, Gary. <laughs> Our house seasoning. A little secret secret yep. dust there. We mix it ourselves. You don't have to tell me all the ingredients. We're, I'll tell you, I ain't scared. Oh, salt, okay. Salt, pepper, and garlic is all it is. That's all, okay. That's all Good. that's in it. Another house touch is that they slowly wet age the steak for 45 days. However, when it hits the grill, it goes fast. So in the, the dome, what's the purpose of the dome? Speed it up. We like to be fast. The Ricky Bobby method. I want to go fast. <laughs> you know, like there's so many restaurants they just come and go, and you got a place here that's been around 70 now. Yeah. What's that mean to you to be carrying the mantle now for a Texas institution? It, it means a lot because not many places can say that. Not many people can say, well, I've eaten there since I was a baby. You know, most people that come in here can say that. That's, that's something special, man. Yes, it is. You don't find it anymore. No, no, you don't. What would Texas be without its traditions? I don't know and I don't want to. But what I do know is that it's time to eat some KC steak. It's kind of cool that you really don't see KC style steaks out of this part of Texas. Ooh, look at that. Medium rare, emphasis on the rare. That's delicious. I'm warning y'all in advance, there's gonna be a lot of chewing in this segment. Definitely something to be said about cooking a steak on a flat iron grill. You get that good sear on the outside, it still stays real juicy in the inside. That is delicious. Mm, 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 mm. I like how we've gotten to a point on this show where I can order something family style, but everybody knows it's just for me. Every town in every corner of Texas has interesting people, meaningful places, and delicious food. Sometimes you just have to look a little harder. But if you start turning over rocks in small Texas towns, well, you're definitely gonna find some amazing things for tripping, especially when those rocks are paint rocks. Oh, I did it, folks. I ate all the steak. But Chet, you didn't eat your vegetables. Mom, what are you doing here? I'm making a show. And did you lie about all that steak? No, I, I don't. <laughs> This is over. Bye, con Dios, amigos. <laughs> Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper.
This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy y'all, Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all of your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, con Dios, amigas.